Okay, so this is your president, Obama. And as a president, he directly affects USA, which would be you, you and me. Now the president also has two other branches that help him do one thing that he's sworn to uphold, which is the Constitution. You know, created by the people, for the people. Basically, it's the assurance of the goodwill of the American people, you know, that things would affect you uh, in a positive way, never in a negative way. Uh, you know, it's basically your safety bubble. That's why we hold on to the American Constitution so much. One thing that helps the president keep his oath to it are two powers. The Senate, you know, and they basically uphold a lot of the laws and treaties. And the other part, Congress. Congress was basically responsible for national defense. So if Obama ever wanted to put a new law into effect, he would also have to go through the Senate to do that. You know, if he wanted to declare war on someone or at least uh, direct some of the troops in how to implement the war or do whatever, you know, to go overseas, he would have to talk to Congress. This is what they call a separation of powers. In absence of separation of powers, what you would have is a dictator. So, what is the problem if these two guys are trying to defend the Constitution for your goodwill? It seems that Obama, I guess, you know, in, in my opinion, ever since he attacked Tripoli, which was in Africa, everyone thinks that he went to Congress and got the, you know, uh, the, the plans and the okay to go ahead and do that. Actually, he didn't. He basically directly got his authority from one place that you are going to grow not to like. Uh, once again, I didn't, I didn't like review this or anything. I'm just basically going to, uh, over uh, everything I've learned. The United Nations. Basically, he overstepped Congress and Senate to basically go over into Tripoli and basically killed Gaddafi so that way he wouldn't set up a new monetary system that would rival ours and put us in a bankrupt. Ever since he's done that, he's turned his eyes back onto us, America. And you can go and, and look at these certain videos. There's one that you can look at. Type in Panetta. And you'll see that Panetta does the same exact thing. Well, who are you asking for the legal basis from? If it's a, obviously if the UN passed a security resolution as it did in Libya, we would do that. Uh, if, uh, if NATO came together as we did in Bosnia, uh, we would rely on that. So, you know, we, we have options here uh, if we want to build uh, the kind of international approach to dealing with the situation. Well, I'm for all for having an in international support, but I, I'm really baffled by the idea that, that somehow an international assembly provides a legal basis for the United States military to be deployed in combat. When Congress asks Obama or when Congress asks Panetta or anybody else that's aligned to them secretly, when they ask him, you know, where are you getting this authority to go into these other countries and do whatever you want? Where are you getting this authority to send 30,000 drones into the U.S. to do surveillance? Where are you getting this authority 
to round up all the guns and ban uh, uh, Americans for having guns, which violates the Second Amendment of the Constitution. Where are you getting all of these, you know, authorities and uh, to do this? Basically, Obama always ends up saying that he is getting his authority from the United Nations. What is the United Nations? The United Nations started after 1945, after World War II. Uh, it basically replaced the League of Nations. Um, they were basically just all these nations that came together and tried to negotiate peace. So, what's the big issue? The reason why I personally will not vote is because there's something Obama is trying to do and I think he'll definitely be successful for it in his second term uh, when he gets reelected because he will. Um, I just know he will. He, he'll, he'll get reelected. If he gets reelected, not only will he, you know, continue to go ahead and put people in internment camps and be able to, you know, arrest anyone that they, they want, you know, what he, which he's already done. You can look, there's a Fox News clip uh, explaining that. U.S. citizens eventually. Joining us right now is Fox News senior judicial analyst and host of Freedom Watch on the Fox Business Network, Judge Andrew Napolitano. Good morning. Stevie, Stevie. good morning. Okay, so explain what this particular provision would do. This is a bill to fund the Defense Department. There's a lot of other bells and whistles in it. Usually One that's is, just uh, pro forma, let's vote. Right. Here's the, here's the amount of money the Defense Department can spend. Here's how we want them to spend it. Right. But Senators McCain and Levin have added this legislation, which would authorize the president to declare the entire United States of America, all 50 states and all territories, to be a battlefield. And that would authorize him to use commander-in-chief authority in the United States to use the military to arrest people in the United States who, in the president's opinion, are enemies of the country. It would then permit him to incarcerate and detain these people indefinitely, to keep them from a lawyer, to keep them from right. a judge, to keep them from a jury, to lock them up for as sure. long as he wants. He'll finally be able to hand over all of the authority of the United States sovereignty to the United, United Nations. Once Obama does that, these people are not, uh, you know, privy to be underneath the Constitution. If you read the Constitution, basically it's something that you don't want to get rid of. If these people actually come into power or actually get power handed over to them by Obama they will override this which means basically all your rights will pretty much be thrown away and the United Nations will be able to implement some new rights what those are I really don't know but I can guarantee you there will be nothing like these um, so that's pretty much the video. Uh, if this also happens, I guarantee you, uh, you will see some civil unrest. And if that happens, if all these other states that don't want to go along with these guys decide to secede and say, you know what, I'm out of this, you know, I'm not going to become a part of the United States, the United Nations, I'm just going to form our own thing because our own thing is better than what these guys are cooking up then guess what's going to happen? These United Nations, just like you've seen throughout Africa and all these other places in the world and India and all these other places, you will see troops come in and enforce their laws, or whatever it is they want, onto these states that have seceded. All these little governors that, you know, basically do not want to go along with this. Uh, they will basically be ran through with UN troops. Yes, I'm talking about the troops that you see with the blue caps, you know, that go all throughout uh, Africa and everywhere else. Those guys will be coming through your streets. This is a guy who oversees emergency planning for Lubbock. 
he is going to try to hand over the sovereignty of the United States to the UN. Mm -hmm. Okay, what's going to happen when that happens? Mm -hmm. I'm thinking worst case scenario. Right, now. right. Okay. I understand. Civil unrest, civil disobedience, civil war, maybe. I and mean, we're not talking just a few riots here and demonstrations. Mm -hmm. We're talking, we're talking Lexington, Concord, take up arms and get rid of the guy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, what's going to happen if we do that? If mm -hmm. the public decides to do that, mm -hmm. he's going to send in UN troops. Mm -hmm. I don't UN want troops, huh? You end with the little troops. blue beanies, right. and the, yeah. okay. I don't want them in Lubbock County, mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to stand in front of their pers armored personnel carriers and say, "You're not coming in here." Mm -hmm. And the sheriff, I've already asked him. I said, "You going to back me?" He said, "Yeah, I'll back you." Mm -hmm. Well, I don't want a bunch of rookies back there. True. I want trained, equipped, seasoned veteran officers. If that would happen. Why this hasn't happened yet? Well, once again, because Obama has not been reelected. Um, that's basically what he wants to do. Uh, I tried to make this as, as simple as possible for you to understand. Uh, so let me go ahead and show you the second video. I'll show you basically everything that Obama said he was going to do and that he didn't. I think we should use the hammer of a potential opt-out as leverage to ensure that we actually get labor and environmental standards that are enforced. A senior member of the Obama campaign called the Canadian government within the last month to say that when Senator Obama talks about opting out of the free trade deal, the Canadian government shouldn't worry. The operative said it's just campaign rhetoric and don't take it seriously. Today, this inconvenient memo found its way onto the public stage. Written by an official at the Canadian consulate in Chicago, it reveals the meeting with senior Obama advisor Austin Goolsby and confirms what we first reported, that he warned of an anti-NAFTA campaign but indicated that this messaging should not be taken out of context and should be viewed as more about political positioning than a clear articulation of policy plans. I'm in this race to take, tell the lobbyists in Washington that their days of setting the agenda are over. They, they have not funded my campaign. They will not work in my White House. Just this weekend, the New York Times published a list of names, a rather long list of names, of people who are working on Obama's transition team or who have accepted jobs in his White House who are either former lobbyists or who have close ties to lobbyists. The Times reports that some of those people were lobbying as recently as this year. And Barack Obama on the campaign trail talked a lot about needing to usher in a change in Washington. Uh, let's just talk briefly about, about a couple of these appointments that have sort of raised uh, questions about that pledge that you have brought up as well as others. Uh, newly installed Treasury Secretary Timothy Geithner appointed Mark Patterson, and this is a former top lobbyist for Goldman Sachs as his chief of staff. And then last week there was a lot of buzz over William Lynn. He was the, appointed to the number two position at the Defense Department. William Lynn, also a former top lobbyist for Ray Raytheon, which is a, uh, one of the five largest defense contractors. So uh, how is that a change in what Washington works, in how Washington works? Well, it's not a change. 